paving the future, developing a pipeline for AI in health and social care. And it's my absolute pleasure to welcome Eleonora Harwich, who is Head of Collaboration at the NHS AI Lab, uh, and a topic very close to my heart because she's heavily involved with the communication and engagement of all stakeholders across the whole continuum of healthcare. Welcome, Eleonora, over to Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vernon. What an introduction. So, uh, as was mentioned, I'm Ellie Horwich, Head of Collaborations at the NHS AI Lab. And today we have a really exciting session around how to pave the future and develop a pipeline for uh, AI in healthcare. So we will be talking about the efforts that the AI Lab is making in developing that pipeline of, of AI innovations from funding the projects through the AI Awards all the way through to understanding how these projects are tested and evaluated. Um, and for this, I have an absolutely fabulous panel joining me today with uh, my colleague, Dan Banford, who's Deputy Director of the AI Awards and also uh, works at the Al Accelerated Access Collaborative within NHS England. We also have Xiao Liu, uh, who's a junior doctor in ophthalmology and a clinical researcher at the University Hospital in Birmingham and is also a member of the Accelerated Access Collaborative and uh, also sits on the advisory group for uh, the award evaluation. And last but not least, uh, Vaughan Lewis, who is Southeast Regional Medical Director uh, at NHS England. So in terms of how this session uh, will run, we will be discussing uh, many key questions around this topic of developing a pipeline for AI and healthcare for the next half an hour just about and then we will address questions from the audience so please do pop in your questions uh in in the in the qa section uh of the platform and i will uh, make sure to to come to these and address them also please do remember to tweet about the event uh, so that those who can't be with us are also informed about the discussion um so Dan, I'm gonna start with you. And could you tell us maybe a little bit about what the NHS AI Lab does and how it's helping to create that pipeline of AI technologies? Sure things, Ellie. And uh, thanks to you and Vernon for inviting me along to speak. It's a real pleasure to be with the COGX audience. Uh, so what we're doing through the NHSX AI Lab in order to build this pipeline of, um, of technologies that will help in um, yeah, it, today as well as in the future is put a large grant pot out supported by some ancillary programs that will help fund technologies but also support their safe and ethical adoption into the NHS and social care. Uh, my team runs the 140 million pound AI and health and social care award so it's a very very large scale grant pot that's designed to um, test at scale technologies that we think can be truly transformative and we're releasing that funding over uh, four funding cycles and i'm delighted that the second the winners of the second funding cycle were announced this morning by um by matt hancock at cogex so exciting to be following up on that now um what we're what we're doing through the award is uh funding technologies through different levels of maturity from early stage concepts through to those that are already in use in the nhs but who are looking for additional um, evidence to support wider rollout and commissioning. I'll touch on that in a, in a second. But this work that we do through the award sits within the wider context of the AI lab who are thinking about you know, what's the full suite of tools and capabilities that the NHS needs in order to drive the, the safe and ethical adoption of, of AI at scale across the NHS and the social care system. Uh, and there's some really important work going on there around um, mapping out our AI strategy, um, thinking about how we create trusted research environments for um, imaging data, thinking about how we work with um, frontline teams through our Skunk Works program to rapidly develop uh, solutions to operational and clinical problems the NHS is facing. And there's a whole host of other programs as well going on um, in the wider lab, which might touch upon. Um, the, the award itself uh, makes um, this 140 million pound pot available to technologies who in our earlier stages are doing some initial feasibility testing of their ideas. Um, it will then make funding available to those a bit more advanced who are thinking about um, the evidence and support they need to do regulatory filings. Um, and then what we also do post uh, marketing authorization is think very carefully, and I'm sure um, Zhao is going to talk about this um, when we come to her, uh, about the the evidence that we require of the um, 
the, the efficacy and utility of these tools in real world operational settings and what we need the tools to demonstrate in order to be confident in their wider rollout. And importantly, how can we work with developers um, and the innovation community to help them understand what needs to be uh, met in terms of evidential thresholds. Mm. We're, we're also going to be really excited about the scale of what we're um, what we've achieved so far through round one and two and delighted to be working with uh, over 80 research sites in the NHS um, and we're supporting um, more and more technologies um, over the rounds to come. So really excited by the scale of what we're doing and keen to see how um, the audience here can um, can engage with us and, and really keen for feedback as well. Yeah, great. Uh, so thank you so much. And it is it is true, you know, work, working in the AI lab, I, I can definitely uh, tell you all that it is very exciting and that there are a lot of things um, going on. But to, to pick up on one of your points, actually, which has to do with with ultimately the you know regulatory framework through which these technologies actually go through and, and, and finding the right way to clinically evaluate these technologies, um, you know, can, can be quite difficult or challenging because they're sometimes new, there are no agreed standards around it. So Xiao, could you actually tell us a little bit more about the current challenges and what are some of the potential solutions? Yeah, it, it is challenging, exactly right. And, and rightly so, because these are new technologies and they are um, very, very early in their development sometimes and um, untested in the wider NHS population. So we're really right to be cautious they're also very easy to deploy widely. And so in terms of the risk profile, it has the potential to cause harm at scale, but it also has a potential to bring benefit at scale. So it's about balancing that. Um, and like you said, um, Ellie, that some of the frameworks are still being set up. So the regulatory bodies internationally are working on this now. We've got interim guidance from the FDA, the MHRA are also looking at this. And it's not just the regulatory frameworks, um, evidence standards, reporting standards, that's an area that I've been working on in the last few years. We've seen um, issues in terms of robustness of the scientific evidence uh, underpinning these technologies, and that's starting to improve um, with initiatives like um, Spirit AI and Consort AI, um, Starred AI and Tripod AI. These are reporting guidelines for how the scientific studies should be reported so that we have that quality evidence, we've got robustness in the methodology, low risk of bias, and um, evidence that's likely to generalize. But we've still got uh, a way to go, and that's partly what the AI award is, is about, is um, testing these technologies in a robust way, meeting that high standard in a UK population at NHS sites. So there's a lot of work to do, but um, it's all happening very quickly as well. That's really interesting. Thank you very much. Um, and also, obviously, you know, once these technologies are tested and evaluated, there's yet another hurdle uh, for, for innovators to go through, which is which is that of commissioning, um, which obviously we, we kind of all know that that, that it is, uh, you know, to to to, to put it nicely, not the kind of easiest of processes within within the NHS and actually understanding how these technologies can be integrated into wider transformation plans can also be challenging. Vaughan, could you tell us how, I guess, you went about it and the kind of challenges that you had to overcome um, as, as obviously for viewers who, who don't know, Vaughan has um, uh, managed to deploy uh, within uh, his his region some uh, AI award uh, winners. So could you tell us a little bit about how that process um, worked? Yeah, sure. So um, so thank you and and uh, and thank you for asking me to uh, to join today's uh, conference. Um, I, I talk particularly about uh, Healthy IO, which is a smartphone enabled. Um, it, um, image analysis of, uh, of of urine dipstick so a urine dipstick is a, uh, is a is a plastic stick with some little pads on it uh, which have got uh, chemical reagents and they respond um, uh, uh, according to the uh, the amount of uh, of 
uh, of, of a constituent of the uh, of the urine. Um, this is uh, these are pads that are conventionally used in a uh, on a on a stick, which is tested either in a GP surgery or in a uh, in a hospital setting. Um, and uh, there are a lot of people who are very reluctant to seek help for something, particularly when they don't have any symptoms. And um, uh, Healthy IO came up with this uh, technology, uh, which was, uh, as I say, smartphone enabled. Um, sent a package off to the, off to the uh, to, to patients who are at risk. Um, get them to take the sample, uh, take a photograph using a smartphone, um, and load up automatically the GP system. Um, I first heard about this at a uh, at a meeting and approached a company and said, "If you're interested in a regional deployment, then I'm up. Um, I'm uh, I'm in." And uh, uh, and, and having been approved through the um, uh, Innovation Collaborative um, first round, um, we we started a relationship and have rolled uh, are in the process of rolling this out across nine million people um, across the southeast. So that's a population of uh, of, a, of a small country, twice the population of some small countries, um, and. Um, we, we haven't uh, we haven't yet rolled out across the entire region, uh, but we're well on the way, and we're already seeing examples of patients who have who are at risk, who have never submitted a urine sample before, um, who's uh, who, who's um, in whom early disease is being identified, which gives the opportunity for early intervention um, uh, and and hopefully long term uh, improvements to their healthcare. Mm -hmm. Actually, how how have you had that conversation with patients in, in, in your area around, you know, the, the kind of these changes to the way that services are delivered, which I can imagine at first can be potentially a little bit unsettling. How, how did you manage that? So, so I, I have I haven't had any direct conversations with patients. You appreciate that. Um, but, yeah. but what I uh, what we I've been working with. Uh, with the company and with clinical leads. And it's clinical leadership, which is absolutely key um, here uh, because uh, the, the clinician-patient relationship is a trusted relationship. Um, uh, and if we can get clinicians on board um, early on in these uh, in these rollouts, um, then that is, um, that is more than half the battle. Um, mm. And the beauty, beauty of some of these um, uh, uh, some of these solutions that are coming forward that are in, in the pipeline um, is that they do offer um, time, genuine time saving uh, and efficiency savings, um, and um, the ability to address some long-standing health inequalities. So, getting results back from patients who, for whatever reason, have been reluctant uh, to, mm. uh, to to submit samples in the past. Before I leave the issue of health inequalities, though, I just want to, um, one of the things that we do need to be cognizant of is digital poverty. And uh, mm. there are sectors of society that are not, uh, that are not internet enabled. Um, yeah. uh, and, and, uh, and so this is not the whole battle. Uh, we, we need to be aware of that. And uh, I think it's an important generic point uh, for a lot of these technologies. Yes. Uh, Dan, I could I could see you nodding. Do you want to to potentially resp respond to that, or was was me was I over interpreting your your nod? <laughs> no, no, I'm. Uh, I need a lot of lot of interesting things that Vaughan touched upon there. Um, on the the health inequalities point, um, the first the first sort of thing to say is it's it's absolutely paramount through all the work that NHSX are doing and and that we're doing through um, the AI award in the Accelerated Access Collaborative. These technologies are deployed in a way that not only don't exacerbate, but actually actively reduce health inequalities. And so one of the one of the aspects that we are um, kind of seeking to evaluate these technologies on is can they de be deployed um, in a generalizable way that's suitable for the whole population? And Vaughan's kind of touched on maybe the more kind of um, patient facing solutions where you need to have, in the case of healthy IO, a patient with a smartphone there are other solutions that we're deploying which are clinician facing and part of a, a pathway within a hospital or part of a pathway that doesn't touch the patient directly. But there are also issues there around um, do all hospitals or GP practices have the requisite digital infrastructure and know how to mm. adopt these technologies. Because what we do not want is either certain demographic populations getting access to tools that others don't or certain providers being in a state to use these tools but others unable to and this ties into the kind of broader um 
you know, kind of digital exemplar work that's going on across um, across the NHS to you know, to raise all boats and ensure we have a, a strong baseline of digital infrastructure to deploy these tools against. Mm. And so obviously there's an aspect around that that which has to do with with how you go about testing these technologies and how do you test for you know the, the does does it kind of behave according to the its intended purpose like does it does it have any kind of external validity all of those things so I guess what would you say to people who have doubts about the kind of robustness of of the evidence around these tools and how we go about you know making sure that they are generalizable and that they, they they're not going to further entrench healthcare inequalities like how do we how do we go about testing that yeah i think that's a really good question and people are right to be cautious i think that's the right approach to to go about this um i think the quality of evidence is generally improving um in the last few years and we are getting much better at um critiquing the quality of evidence coming through um that's uh something that is being addressed by the ai award in terms of the bar is set very high and you have to demonstrate um, you know, accuracy and effectiveness and cost effectiveness and safety of the algorithm in order to meet that bar. In, if It depends who's asking the question as well. So, I mean, if it's the clinical teams that are asking the question, I would also make the point that it's partly their responsibility to ensure the safety, the ongoing safety um, after mm. deployment of these algorithms too. And um, using the clinical tools that we're used to, like auditing, um, we, we, we can continue to ensure the safety uh, of, the, of these algorithms. And just on that Dan's last point around ensuring that, you know, we don't leave certain population groups behind and that yeah. these algorithms are generalizable across different um, population groups. That's a really important question to ask. And we have seen um, algorithms that perform better on the majority population groups and perform worse on minority groups, and we have to be really aware of that. And unless you specifically test for that, you can't know the answer. So that is something that um, is really important to bear in mind as well. And is and is that something that you know will you think be become a, a standard way of testing for for these products? Because obviously now it feels like it's you know it's it's something that some some are doing, but it's not necessarily a systematic thing. Yeah, I, I hope I hope so. Um, so, um, you know, we need buy in from the key gatekeepers as well. So regulators, policymakers, commissioners to demand that level of evidence, not just across mm. the aggregate population, but also within subsets. Um, yeah. And that's really important as to where you're deploying and the population makeup of where you're deploying as well. Of course. Great. So we have some audience questions coming in uh, just as a, as a gentle reminder to our listeners, if you could uh, potentially uh, add, add more questions to the Q&A chat, that would be uh, great. I will start tackling them uh, shortly. Actually, to, to go back to one of Va Vaughan's points around um, the importance of having leadership in order to be able to, to deploy these um, technologies, I guess another side of that coin is also making sure that there is long-term funding around uh, these these technologies. So um, I guess, how, how are we going to ensure the long-lasting impact of these technologies to Make sure that they're not you know going to be decommissioned but actually really kind of Im embedded in the system so I'll maybe vaughn go first to you and then um get dan's perspective from a kind of more national uh national perspective on this sure so that's a, that's a kind of killer question isn't it um, <laughs> and it's um uh, but i think it's really interesting to reflect on uh, on the experience of the nhs over the last uh, 15 months during the covid uh, and uh, during, during the covid response um and things that uh, i don't think any of us really believed were possible have been achieved and they've been achieved partly by throwing out the rule book around pbr and other commissioning models and it's just demonstrated what can be achieved uh, if you haven't got those uh, ultimately artificial Official constraints on, uh, on on activity. Um, so I think it's incumbent on us all in leadership positions. Um, uh, and I um, I work with, although I'm not directly involved in uh, in, in the finances of the NHS, but I, I work with people who are. Um, and certainly, I'm having those conversations about innovative payment mechanisms um, mm -hmm. that uh, that enable the deployment of uh, of AI and other technologies, rather than um, rather than cut them dead. After a uh, after a pilot period, 
Yeah. Uh, so just as a quick reminder, for those of you who, who don't know, PBR is, it stands for payment by result, uh, just for those of you Thank who you. are not au fait with the, with the, with the healthcare lingo. Uh, and, and Dan, from a kind of national perspective, what, what do you think are the, the levers that we could potentially pull to, to avoid this? Yeah. So, so um, the sort of nightmare scenario for, um, for those kind of looking at driving uh, innovation across the NHS is you have some central funding, like from the AI award, um, you do one, two, three years worth of research and roll out. It's very successful patients, clinicians and others like it. And then the national pot dries up and there's no um, segue into, into a locally led commissioning. So we're, we're thinking very hard now, you know, two years in advance of the end of our, our funding cycles about what that transition looks like. And it's an interesting time to be doing this because the commissioning landscape is changing with the... Um, the legislation in Parliament around the creation of ICSs and their role around um, controlling budgets. But what's going to be clear is that the three sources of funding will be locally held funding, which is likely to become increasingly important, um, funding associated with payment for primary care services, and then national specialised commissioning budgets. And we've got an opportunity now to speak to stakeholders you know, who, who control those three budgets to think about how do we form kind of creative approaches to providing some um, uh, frameworks uh, that give adopters of innovations as well as innovators, their investors and other stakeholders some confidence about what the kind of medium term future for um, the deployment of these technologies are because that that sort of that confidence will support investment in the NHS and will support clinicians adopting these tools not being worried about do we change the mm. pathway and then in one year we have to to undo it. Um, and I'd, I'd finish by saying I think Vaughan has sort of hugely underplayed um, his personal role in leading some of some the drives in the southeast, uh, both in Healthy IO and some other technologies. I think what's what's really stark is if we hear from medical leaders on the ground or in kind of key national roles like Vaughan's that certain technologies are useful and they act as champions, there's a huge amount we can do. Um, and it's about finding the sweet spot between that sort of the risk and benefit um, at scale trade-off that, that Zhao um, outlined earlier, but there's there's definitely a lot we can do. Um, it just requires some kind of creative thinking and, and a lot of stakeholders um, working on this together. <laughs> yeah, for sure. And obviously to, to kind of go back on that point, which is ultimately, you know, the, the, the kind of key question of, of 2020, 2021, which is, you know, the, the impact that COVID has had on, on the innovation um, landscape and, and the NHS's kind of desire to, to adopt, uh, innovate and kind of make best use of technology. How, how do you feel that that has impacted you locally, Vaughan? Well, so, I mean, a good example of that is the Brainomics Stroke Suite. Um, mm. So Brainomics is a UK IAI imaging company uh, specialising in acute stroke imaging decision to support. Um, and um, we, uh, in, in the South East, uh, very early on, recognised that this had a role in um, uh, in enabling patients um, in a health service that was uh, in, in many respects, although very agile in terms of the COVID response, um, non-COVID activity was significantly compromised by the virus. Um, and the, uh, the Brainomic Stroke Suite uh, enabled us to, um, to support clinicians in hospitals across the region um, and ensure that patients who were eligible and stood to uh, benefit from intervention in specialist neuroscience centres from clot removal and, uh, for example, uh, were able to access that in a timely way. And this is an intervention that is absolutely uh, time uh, critical. Um, and, um, and in fact, uh, one, of the, one of the digital managers in my team is now uh, working in a national role um, to, uh, to try and roll out brainomics um, across all seven regions of, uh, of NHS England. Um, so it's areas like that that, um, uh, that, that I think, and, and experiences like that that have been, um, that could have happened without COVID, but were enabled by COVID, but that will, um, uh, will already make a huge difference moving forwards. Mm. And actually, I guess, Another area that COVID has had an impact on is is also the kind of regulatory pathway, at least for the vaccines, uh, has been quite a, uh, greatly accelerated. Um, do you feel that that it has had an impact at all about the the speed at which we expect to generate good enough evidence, yeah, or or has it not kind of really pervaded uh, the world of technology? 
Well, I, I think certain areas have definitely just needed to be prioritized um, simply because we've had to reshape the way that we deliver care. And if, you know, a face to face um, solutions just weren't feasible anymore in terms of waiting times, we've had to move towards digital innovations. And so that kind of prioritization has meant that we can generate evidence more quickly. There are areas where you can you, you can't speed up evidence. So one of the major sort of deficits um, in evidence for AI technology around uh, at the moment is around health outcomes. Actually, showing that your technology can improve outcomes as opposed to just something like accuracy. And in those sorts of scenarios where you have to wait for someone to either be okay or develop a complication or a disease. You can't always speed up the evidence generation in that sense, but what you can perhaps do is be more flexible around which point you deploy and monitor very closely as you're deploying. So clearly that needs to be on a case by case decision and it's a um, balance of risk and benefits. But I think the pandemic has forced us to be more flexible in the way that we think about this. Um, so, yeah. Great. Um, and actually, we got, we got a question from the audience that I think would be would be quite quite suited to you, Zhao, which is about the the kind of checks and balances, for example, or, you know, peer review to ensure that um, AI and machine learning algorithms actually perform when uh, anecdotal evidence might challenge some of the methods uh, that that are, that are being used. So, what what are the types of of checks and balances aside from, say, um, publication in a peer reviewed uh, journal that that are in place to make sure that 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 these algorithms that are deployed are, are robust? Well, um, so there's a number of checkpoints that any algorithm has to meet. Clearly, it has to meet the regulatory requirements. They need to have very strong post-market um, clinical follow-up strategies. Um, if they're publishing evidence, it needs to conform to existing guidelines um, to ensure that all the information is there um, and replicable. So the, the reporting guidelines I mentioned earlier, if they're to be commissioned within the NHS, they need to meet the nice evidence standards. And so we, you know, not all of those things are new, but some have been adapted for AI and um, anecdotal uh, evidence or not, any AI um, intervention that's going to be brought out in the NHS needs to meet those requirements. Great, thank you very much. Um, so we've had a, a question. I mean, I'm going to go to you, Dan, uh, from the audience. Um, so a, a patient uh, public group representative um, is is asking, how do we go about engaging with uh, patients and and the public about um, the use of these technologies, how they're deployed, maybe also how some of the information around the evidence is actually explained to, to the lay person. So what, what, what are we doing about that? Well, I mean, I think this is a hugely important topic, Ellie, and it's one that we are, um, you know, developing our, our approach on and really keen to kind of pick up offline with the person who's asked the question to, to hear their thoughts. Um, I think what's really clear is the, the commitment to evolving patients and public in, in everything we do in the NHS is is absolutely kind of baked into our DNA. It's, it's elaborated in the long term plan. It's, com it's committed to again in the National Clinical Research Vision, which was published um, I think a couple of months ago. And it's also there in, in the national commitment around um, design and innovation. So at a high level, incredibly supportive. What are we doing practically through the lab um, and the work at AAC? Well, Firstly, there's um, the rigor around evaluation of tools and this idea of proving that the tool is generalizable and works for all, not just for um, kind of limited uh, parts of the population. Uh, secondly, we're doing um, a, a really interesting piece of work through the Accelerated Access Collaborative's research team around examining the um, the issues uh, the patient and public involvement and engagement issues pertinent to AI as a category and um, pertinent to some um, uh, specialties within that and we're going to publish that report in September which will very much be the start of a conversation that we would like to you know, like to have um, nationally with um, uh, patient and public groups as well as sort of uh, local individual um, representatives uh, and then lastly, it's worth flagging some of the work that the AI Lab is doing on, on the ethical um, uh, implementation of AI technologies. 
so that there are specific research programs which um, are um, you know, will be will be consulted on as part of their program, so open for engagement on um, relating to health inequalities, algorithmic bias, um, and how we empower clinicians to make the best use of AI tools and to free up time to care. So that hopefully gives a, a bit of a sketch about um, where we see the role of um, you know, patient involvement, which is absolutely central, and also yeah. some of the, the programs and activities where, where people can engage. Yeah, absolutely. And actually adding to, 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 to that to that list is is uh, also the public engagement that we're doing uh, with the drafting of the national strategy for AI and health and care. So we do have focus groups uh, that are specifically looking at uh, people's perception and feelings about the different applications of, of AI and healthcare. So it is something that is really core to the way that we work and we try to embed it as much as possible in, into the working practices of, of the lab. Um, and actually, so talk, talking about how how to alleviate the burden on uh, doctors. Uh, we got a question from the audience uh, saying that, you know, obviously that there are some rumors uh, and, and beliefs around what AI can do and some uh, holding the belief that it actually might eventually completely replace um, doctors. So th the question is, do you feel uh, what, what do you think which field at least is is maybe at risk of total automation um, or is it a question of uh, of doctors actually adapting and needing to change their skill sets in order to be able to to make best use of of, of those technologies or is there you know a, a different type of skill set that that they also need to develop in order to survive in this kind of new healthcare industry that will be a completely digitally enabled so Vaughan if I could go to you for that question yeah, so um, so I think uh, the the idea that AI will replace doctors um, sits very firmly and is likely to sit very firmly in the realms of science fiction for uh, for some years to come. Um, I, I think there's some really good examples of AI being used to complement um, uh, cl clinically trained staff. Um, every time a, um, a, a mammogram is taken to a, a breast, um, an X-ray of the breast for screening purposes to identify uh, early stage cancer, um, that uh, those images are uh, reviewed by two. Uh, separate radiologists um, who are unaware of the, uh, the the report of of each other, um, and, uh, and and only if they concur um, uh, is uh, is no further action taken, unless of course they concur that uh, that there is a problem there, um, in which case the patient is referred. Um, if they disagree, then uh, then the X-ray is further reviewed. Uh, what's been demonstrated um, in uh, in the East Midlands Radiology Consortium. Um, is that uh, if you have uh, if you use AI technologies to uh, to replace one of those reporting radiologists, um, that it actually improves or is is at least as good at and if not better than uh, than having two separate reporting radiologists. Now, there's a really good example of a of AI freeing up clinician time. Um, there are very few areas where um, we are um, uh, we have a surfeit of doctors. Um, very few, if any, areas. Um, and I think uh, a number of these technologies that are emerging, and again, I come back to the brainomics, a um, you know, really good example of, uh, of, of, uh, of enhancing decision support, helping doctors in sometimes in remote locations to make better decisions uh, for the patients in front of them. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think that, um, uh, that, we, that the medical profession needs to uh, embrace AI technologies. It needs to learn to, uh, to work with them. Uh, certainly shouldn't be threatened uh, by, mm. by, uh, by AI because um, uh, I, I think we can only stand to, uh, to gain as a medical profession and ultimately uh, improve the health of the, uh, of, of the nation. Yeah. Do you, do you think that maybe there's also like a, because I guess the question was also trying to, to get at, at maybe what's the skill set of the future for like that, that doctor that will, that will have the, the, the kind of um, uh, decision support tool, what else would they need to be skilled in? Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so look. I mean, the last um, the, the last uh, few decades are, are littered with examples of uh, of new technologies coming along, um, and uh, in fact, you can go back further centuries. You know, when um, uh, when the idea of uh, when, um, of of, of, uh, of of letting blood was um, uh, was first, you know. This is there, there are always we've always had to uh, we've had to adapt to innovations, and some innovations uh, 
on, on reflection um, were not good news. Others clearly are good news. And the medical profession is good at, uh, at evaluation, mm. is getting better at real world evaluations. Um, and what's really important is that we don't um, uh, deploy something until it has been evaluated in a research setting initially in a yeah. lab and then in, uh, in uh, under very controlled circumstances um, yeah. so I think that's that's part of the march of progress it's uh, it, we see it in every walk of life and uh, in many respects healthcare in, uh, ha has been somewhat slow to uh, to, to, to innovate in this uh, in the digital space and uh, the developments that we've seen in recent years are most welcome and I think herald um, a uh, if not an exponential, then a significant increase in um, in enabling supportive technologies uh, that will ultimately improve the, uh, the, the the health of the nation. Um, my final point is that this is not all about high tech. Um, uh, innovations at the sharp end um, mm. the real the real gains of the thing that will make a huge difference to the to, to population health uh, is focusing on, uh, on on early identification prevention um, stuff that actually typically we haven't done terribly well um, uh, and if you can do uh, large-scale um, identification of patients at risk um, using uh, AI technologies um, then that can only uh, improve the, uh, the health of the nation and, and ultimately the, uh, the, the, the cost of, uh, of downstream uh, interventions.